My name's Rosemary, I guess I'm one of Ireland's hidden homeless, more or less. Uh, I've been homeless since my mid-teens um, due to a separation in my family. Um, my mum was alcoholic and bad things happened and we went our separate ways. It was probably for the best for both of us. And at that time I was basically selling handicrafts, playing music and sleeping in doorways. It's broadly remained the same since then. There's been a couple of halting sites. There's been a garage, like this one, um, but that was in England. The last halting site was four years, but it's been pretty much broken. I haven't had a place to call home since I was roughly 15. I sell the big issue outside Talbot Mall and it's not a bad place, but most of the time you're like a ghost there. You might as well not be there. Most people will walk past you as if they don't, they don't even see you. Or if they, they do see you, they don't acknowledge you in any way, shape or form. You'll say, big issue, sir, big issue, madam, especially if you hear them talking. Big issue, folks. And they don't even say, no, thank you. They don't even have the courtesy or decency to acknowledge, hello, you have just spoken to me. And I find that very frustrating. It makes you feel empty. It makes you feel almost resentful because there's this sense that you are somehow untouched, that you are somehow dirt. Something, something nasty stuck on the bottom of someone's shoe. Sometimes you'll get a good interaction. Someone will come up, they'll be real positive. You know, you know how long are you doing this, blah, blah, blah. And you'll engage and you'll actually end up having a conversation, but it's, it's getting increasingly rare. You're partly blind, are you? Yeah, I'm visually impaired, yeah. Second. She's not able to say hello to you, she's rather friendly. I get my money. <laughs> <laughs> it's Doug in the middle of all the stuff. Isn't that right, Dougie? Aren't you great, aren't you? She's a good girl. Uh, I was born in Kilconnell, and as you can probably hear, I've spent some time in the UK when I was a kid. We used to do the horse fairs and do the circuses and do the fairgrounds and go door to door selling. And uh, when I first became homeless, it wasn't known that I had a sight defect. Not even I knew I had a sight defect. I assumed I saw the same as everybody else. And it was discovered when I couldn't read things, they thought that I was illiterate. And it was only after interaction with an old woman who had, who had a magnifier, who I actually helped fill a form, that they realized I could read but I just couldn't physically see what was on the paper in front of me. So I was taken to a low vision clinic and diagnosed from there. This is St. Joseph's Penny Dinners. I've been coming here for several years. Um, there's a group of us, we sort of have a sense of community between us because we, we basically eat and have dinner every day in here, or certainly Monday to Friday and it provides good service. Um, it costs a euro if you have it. If you don't have it, they don't ask you for it. It's not a demand. And the staff are friendly, and it's actually quite a good space to have your dinner in. So this is where I eat during the daytimes, at lunchtime. Not quite so One thing that I do find is an advantage. Whenever you're going to Focus Island, they ask you your name and your birth date. And if there's someone behind you in the queue, this is quite invasive in one way or another. Same in Merchant's Key. Um, it's something I never liked. It's, it's like they're cataloguing you. It almost feels like they're studying you. And it's not comfortable when you're going in for dinner. It's not comfortable to have this notion that you have to give your name and birthday out before they'll let you in. It's, I think it restricts things in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, in here you'll get a table of five, sixes and, and we're friends. And it's just like a bunch of friends going and having dinner together, not this. You forget that it's because you're poor, you forget that it's because you don't have. But here you are just human. And that's it, human and in need. And this is my current, well, home, daytime home. Um, I'm a rough sleeper. I sleep rough all over the place. 
I will sleep in here if the weather is particularly bad. I've slept through, in here through sub-zero temperatures, through snow. The roof leaks a bit and there's problems with condensation, but I've insulated the walls and I will insulate the ceiling eventually. And this is what me and my guide dog have as a private space. You can't say we'll arrange to meet in town for 11 o'clock and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> don't know what time we'd arrive at. We mightn't even get on a bus because we don't count. It's time we made them listen. It's time we made them count. We made them count us as human people with rights. So it's time each and every one of us made our voices heard. The last hostel I was offered had 44 steps in a spiral staircase going up three floors. And literally I was unable to access the room I was offered. And it was completely unsuitable. And they think this is acceptable in this day and age. We are literally living as second class citizens in a country where we are supposed to have equal rights and this is not being done. And it's time they were called out and it's time that they were accountable. If you don't have any government supports, which I don't, you learn how to survive and you learn what you need to do to survive. And whether that's finding food for you, securing the next bag of dog food, etc., etc., you you learn to prepare. And generally, you prepare for the worst. And you also prepare that you could just lose it in in a heartbeat, literally. Anything you have secured, you can basically lose in a heartbeat. That's happened to me a couple of times, and it's pretty damning when it happens. But you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you have no choice but to start again. And that's what you keep doing. It just feels like one constant struggle of starting again, start again, start again. There never seems to be anything above starting again. I go every evening, I go find me cardboard. But the cardboard was close, thankfully, today, but it's not like that on a Saturday night or a Sunday night. You've got to walk long distance to find cardboard. And then just bed out, that's all you can do. I mean, pretty much this is a given that this is my doorway at the moment, but if I don't sleep here for several days, it will no longer be my doorway again, and then I have to find a new doorway because someone will be in it. <laughs> That's her for the night, she just basically won't move. She's just happy where she is. You got a twist, anyway, good girl. Good night. There's very little interaction with passers-by. Sometimes, because of the dog, people will speak to me, but it's very, very rare. You know, or they'll make a comment, oh, beautiful dog, uh, you know, poor dog sleeping out, and it's like, things like this, but it's very superficial. Fuck. Here it comes again. I hate that fuck. Up up here. Up up. Phone fishing. Good girl. Okay, got it. Good girl. Here. Back to bed. Back to bed. Good girl. Three, two, one. Down. Good girl. What would be ideal for me would be somewhere that's a bungalow, fairly easy open access, probably with an acre of land, a couple of acres of land would be nice. <laughs> um, grow my own food on some of it, have a horse, a few chickens, probably a goat, a couple of dogs and be somewhere where I could commute into a city if I need, you know, for supplies effectively. 
I don't mind commuting carrying a rucksack to get supplies or even walking a good distance. But uh, this is a pipe dream. Good girl. 